You know, it wasn't hard for me at all to fall in love with rock and roll music as a kid because I grew up in a family that was super musical. So I remember my sisters, uh, they would dance, they would do ballet and uh, jazz, not like like real jazz, but like, you know, dance and jazz. And when you have two sisters, you know, I got roped into all that stuff. Don't make fun of me. You're not allowed. But when I was about eight years old, I was the tap dance kid in my sister's uh, dance recital. Yeah, I'm not showing you any of it. Don't even, don't even think about it. I shouldn't even told you. I'm not telling any of the other services about that. I, I, knew, I knew it was a bad idea right up top. I'm like, this is not a smart idea. So anyway, you know, and so, so sure enough, I'll never forget when all of a sudden, you know, MTV came on the TV and there were these speakers, lines of speakers with these dudes who were headbanging. You know what I mean? Because like I'm a child of the 80s. And so, you know, the, those great rock bands of the 70s, insert your favorite one, they had these walls of speakers and these guys would be out there. And like I was just being the tap dance kid. So I'm watching these guys headbang. I'm like, that's awesome. I want to do that. You know, and, and I found out later that there was really only one or two of those amplifiers that had speakers in it. The rest were just totally for decor. You know what I mean? But I remember when I, when I picked up my first electric bass when I was in eighth grade, I got an electric bass, and I was playing it at home, and it was cool, but I'm like, I need to get me an amplifier, you know? Because you know, like, when you're playing that bass, it just sounds like clanky, clanky strings, you know? But then you plug that thing in the amplifier, and so sure enough, we went up to see my cousin, my cousin Craig, who's a phenomenal guitar player. Actually, today, you know, he started as an electric guitar player. He was like a shredder, but now he plays the lute, which is like a Baroque instrument. He lives in Italy. He's super Renaissance that way, legitimately. And, uh, but back in the day, he was in all these, like, hair bands, metal bands and stuff, and so he call, when I called him, I told him I got a bass. He's like, do you have an amp? I'm like, no, he's like, I got the perfect amp for you. Next time you come in, I'll give it to you. And so sure enough, I go to see my cousin Craig, and I walk in, there's this huge amplifier. It was like almost as big as me. And he's like, you could have that. And my mom was just like, no. <laughs> don't, don't give it to him. But sure enough, I'm like, I hugged the amplifier. I was, like a little, I was like a little kid. I'm like, I'm taking this thing home with me. And I remember, and my, my, aunt, my aunt Arlene, who's my cousin Craig's uh, mom, is like, you're not allowed to turn that on in the house right now. And my mom got super nervous. So sure, if I, we cut this thing home, I remember I, I put it in my room, you know, plugged it in. I got my sister's full-length mirror. <laughs> put it in the front. I turned that thing on. I turned the volume as far as I could, turned the bass up, and I went on the bass, and I was home. My dad came upstairs, the whole house is shaking, what are you doing? And this thing is feeding back. And, I, and at that moment, I'm like, yes. So much better than being in my sister's dance recitals. So much better. No, but what made it so good? Because that amplifier's job is to take what doesn't make a lot of sound on its own and make that thing so loud that the neighbor's kids could hear it in another state, you know? And today we're starting a new series called Amplify because as a church family, we've been walking through Paul's letter to the Romans. And as we went through chapters 1 to 11, we've been seeing what is, who is God and what has God done for us in Jesus and important, very important things. But then as Paul gets to chapter 12 and as he finishes out the letter, as was his normal way of working, first he'd explain this is the truth about God. And then he'd say, because of who God is, how shall we now live, right? And Romans chapters 12 through 16 exist to say, because of who Jesus is, how should we live? And we're calling it as a series, we're calling it Amplify because we believe that what God wants to do is God wants to amplify the good news of who he is in our lives and through our lives and then not just each one of us as an individual amplifier of who Jesus is into the world, but then when you take all of us as the Crossroads family together and then all of us as the people of God and you put it together, now all of a sudden you got something because you have all these amplifiers declaring the message. So in order to get at that, I want you to open up your Bibles, Romans chapter 12. Romans 12, we're gonna be taking verses one to eight together. Romans 12, verses one to eight. Now, if you didn't bring a Bible with you to church today, don't worry, because all those books on the seats in front of you, those are Bibles. I want you to pull them out. I want you to be able to read along with me. Also, if you have a smart device, if you're like, I don't like books, I'm allergic to paper, it's not gluten-free, or whatever, you know, just just pull out your mobile phone, open up your favorite browser window. You'll catch that one later. <laughs> Gluten-free paper. Anyway, 
You know, uh, Romans 12, verses 1 to 8 in your favorite browser window. And of course, if you didn't bring a Bible with you today, I want you to bring your Bible with you next week. I mean, it's just a fun thing just to be able to, to bring a Bible with you wherever you go. I do it all the time. So Romans, if you're new to the Bible at all, if you don't know where the book of Romans is, your Bible is broken up into two big sections as we predominantly call it. The first two thirds of your Bible is what's called the Old Testament or everything from the creation of all that we can see, the cosmos, to a couple hundred years before Jesus. We call that the Old Testament. And then the last third of your Bible is called the New Testament. And it begins with the foretellings of the story of Jesus. We call them gospel and then the book of Acts and then Paul's letter to the Romans. So the book of Romans is, of course, the sixth book in the New Testament, chapter 12. And it begins uh, this way. Romans chapter 12, verse one says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, if I were to boil down these two verses into one big idea for all of us, it's simply this, that you and I, we need to present ourselves for transformation, you present yourself for transformation. Now, if you think about that, this idea, you present yourself. Look what he's saying. He's saying in verse 1, I implore you, I beseech you, I urge you, therefore, by the mercies of God, because of God's mercy, right? And really, that idea of because of God's mercy, it gives the whole story of Romans 1 to 11 in a simple phrase, that God is a merciful God. God doesn't give us what we deserve. The whole message of Jesus is simply the fact that you and I have failed, and that instead of just judging us as failures, God says, you are a failure, but I'm going to redeem you. I'm going to forgive you. The reason why Jesus is still today the most talked about controversial, hotly uh, debated figure in history is because he was God's provision for the fact that all of us fail. Now, you might be saying, well, why would God do that? And that's a great question. The Bible speaks a lot about that. You might be saying to yourself, well, I didn't want God to do that. Well, guess what? God doesn't need your, uh, your, your approval to do what he wants to do. If you have kids, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? How many times are you going to say, I don't want you to do that? And your parents are like, well, that's what we do. It's kind of the way the world works, whether you like it or not. You see, God knew that what everybody needed was a savior. And that's why he sent Jesus. And, and, and that's all based on God's mercy. And he says, you know, I urge you, brethren, because of God's mercy, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, that's where I get this idea, Dave, to present yourself. See, it's not that you have to do this. You're invited to do this. You, you present yourself to do this. Now, the idea of present your bodies as a living sacrifice, the idea of our bodies, the, our body speaks in this context of the totality of our lives because your body is actually the vehicle through which you experience this world. So anywhere that your body is, that's where you are. You know what I mean? And so, so your body is the vehicle by which you're experiencing life. And so the idea of presenting your bodies as a living sacrifice, that the, for, for the people in that day and age, sacrificing to God was a very common thing. Now, it's not as common today. Where, where people would come and they would bring of their grain of their harvest. They would bring of the animals that, that provided their substance and they would offer it as a sacrifice to God. But really what God is looking for from us, he's, there's an invitation to say, will you bring yourself and will you present yourself to God as a living sacrifice? Not a, a sacrifice that's dying, but a sacrifice that is literally, I'm still alive but I'm giving myself over. Now I think this is really important that you and I, Right now, right here, no matter if you've been following Jesus for a long time or if right now you just came because somebody invited you or you're just exploring Jesus, this idea that God is inviting you to present yourself to him. Now, if you think about that, it's kind of a powerful thing because in any way that if you want to make a change in your life of any sort, it begins with you bringing yourself somewhere. Like, I don't know about you, but I've had about 9,000 uh, beginnings and endings of journeys to try and be in shape, right? Am I the only one in that, in that category? Okay, there's a, f a few of you, and the rest of you need to be, <laughs> you know? 
Because this is the day and age in which we live, right? And so, but it's amazing how many times you're like, okay, I need to do something here, right? Now, the thought that I need to do something here is a good starting point, but it doesn't actually get you there. You know, I, w- I was reading an article about, uh, about gyms, you know, like when they, have, they open up these gyms. And, and the gyms are actually designed on, at the beginning of every year, there's a big special, right? There's no uh, membership fee, just pay the monthly fee. Because what they know is that if they, at the beginning of the new year, everyone's like, I need to get in shape. I mean, the holidays are over. I was a glutton and I need to fix this thing now. And so I'm going to go to the gym. But what happens is, is, you know, for the first two weeks in January in the gym, the gym is crowded, Right? And then after the third week, guess what? It's empty like it always is. Because it's one thing to sign up for the gym, and it's another thing to show up to the gym. Right? But here's the other thing. It's another thing to show up at the gym and actually do something. See, what I learned is that many, many times I would sign up for the gym. I would present myself. It's time for me to get this thing together. And I'd show up to the gym. But there's a, a unique thing about my personality that you would never have guessed. It's simply the fact that I'm really social. Right? And so I show up to the gym and there's all these people there, you know, and, I, and I'm a pretty friendly person. So I'm like, hey, what's going on? How's it going? And then before you know it, I know everybody at the gym. So you know what I'm working out when I'm at the gym? My jaw muscles. I'm leaning on the machine. Just John. You know, and then of course they find out, oh yeah, hey, you're the, one of the pastors at Crossroads, right? Yeah. And then you're like, oh, now, we're, now we're doing ministry. We're talking about Jesus. And I would go to the gym, but guess what? I wasn't getting transformed at the gym. I would look at the clock. I'm like, oh, I'm late. I got to go home now. I go home and Lynn be like, you didn't even break a sweat. I'm like, I know. She's like, you must be really in shape. I'm like, (laughs) so it's one thing to go to the gym. It's another thing to be at the gym and actually do something productive. Now I bring this up because guess what? As it relates to the things of God, right? There are people who, like some of you right now, you're like, yeah, I would never kind of present myself to God. So so you're just like, look, I'm just not interested in being spiritually transformed. And like, so there, so it's a non-starter, right? And and you, you need to want to actually be changed for it to start, right? But then if you start showing up to church, guess what? You could still show up to church, quote unquote, and not grow at all. Because you could show up and just hear the stuff. Like you could be like me at the gym, except you're at church where you're, you're at church, but you're actually not engaging in what's being talked about. You're not worshiping. You're not saying, hey, how does this message apply to my life? Or maybe you're one of those people, you just look around the church and you're like, ooh, so-and-so is here. I don't like that person. I can't believe that person's a Christian. You know? And that stuff goes on at church. What's funny is they're probably saying the same thing about you. That's a different discussion, you know? And what goes on is that you're there, but you're not really there as a living sacrifice, right? You're at the place, but you're not actually engaging with it. And Paul's saying, listen, I want to urge you, because of God's mercy, that you present yourself as a living sacrifice. And he says, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. He's saying that when you bring yourself as a sacrifice, as a living sacrifice, God wants to do a work in you. Right? And he wants to make you set apart holy as he is holy. He's ex- made you acceptable because of Jesus. And he said, it's, your re- it's the reasonable thing to do given what we know about Jesus. Now, I, I think it's a fascinating thing that the Apostle Paul tells us that presenting yourself to God for transformation is the most reasonable thing you can do given who Jesus is and what he's done. And I'll be honest with you, I've learned this in my own life. When I started exploring Christianity when I was in my early 20s, I started to realize like if Jesus died for me, it's not crazy to say I'm going to follow him. And I, and, I, and I was one of those people who searched all the religions and Christianity was the last place because at, you know, having grown up the way I grew up, it was part of our culture. You know, and I was like, there's nothing to this. Because I saw this stuff, I'm like, ugh. And I checked out all the other things because that was what was cooler and, and more interesting. And then when I came to Jesus and I read the Gospels, I was like, actually, it's super reasonable if Jesus died on a cross for me to say, I'm going to devote my life to following him. That's not an irrational thought. Right? He pulls it your reasonable service. And then he explains it even more. What does this mean to present yourself for transformation? In verse 2, because it says... And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, what's interesting here is what you learn is that at every single point of your life, you are presenting yourself to something and something is happening. If you do not present yourself as a living sacrifice to God, then you're going to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. But if you choose not to, guess what? You're presenting yourself to this world in which we live and you are going to be conformed to it. So the idea of I'm my own person, I do it my own way, that's a total lie. Either way, every single day, you are being either conformed or transformed. So what's amazing is, is what you realize is that either way, somebody is shaping you. Either way, there is something right now that is making you into something that you were not the day before. And it's a question of conformity or transformation. Now you think about what conformity is. Conformity is when you fall into lockstep with what's going on around you. Right? It's like if you remember uh, that, that classic movie, The Dead Poet Society, when all the kids are walking in a circle, and before you know it, they're all walking in the same rhythm, right foot at the same time. If we did it right now, if I just said, hey, does anyone think this? And if everyone raised their hand, even though if it was totally wrong, the people who kept their hands down, it takes a lot of self-control to keep your hand down because you just want, everyone wants to just join in. And really what's going on is it's saying, look, you are either presenting yourself as a living sacrifice to Jesus and he's transforming you, or you're not, and you're just becoming like everybody else. You're being conformed. And it's kind of a, a provocative idea, isn't it? That either way, something's shaping you. You're either letting the world, the, the world system, an, an anti-God way of looking at everything shape you, or you're being transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, of course, the Apostle Paul also said this in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. See, what's fascinating here is he's saying, with an unveiled face, because of what God has done for us in Christ, the Spirit of God has taken away the veil from our face, and we're beholding God's glory as if in a mirror. And as we gaze upon the Lord, we are being transformed from glory to glory. Now that word transformed, we get our word metamorphosis from this word. It's metamorpho in the Greek language. And it literally means to completely transform from the inside out. And that's exactly what Jesus offers a person. When a person puts their faith and trust in Jesus, Jesus is saying, look, you can either be conformed, be made like the world in which we live, or you can be transformed because by your faith in Jesus, the Spirit of God now is going to unveil your face so that you can behold who Jesus is. And as you behold him, you're being transformed from glory to glory. Or it says here, by the renewing of your mind. See, what God wants to do is he wants to do a work of renewal in the way that we think. Why we think what we think. How we think what we think. What I've learned is that as a follower of Jesus, the Spirit of God loves me enough when I have a crazy thought, and I know you'd be shocked to realize I have some of those. When I have those, you think to yourself, why am I thinking that? Like when you get all up in arms over something because somebody did something that you didn't like, and then you realize, wait, I've done that 97,000 times. So why am I, like, I've done that. I know what that feels like. Right? And all of a sudden, the Spirit of God comes and convicts you because He's renewing your mind. He's saying, listen, or you start having these thoughts that you're like, I have that thought, but that's not a biblical thought. That's, my, that's when I know God's doing a work in someone's life. When you start having Bible verses that contradict the way that you think. Right? Or like this just happened to me the other day. I was having a situation was going on and I was feeling a little surly about it. And a, and a verse just passed through my mind. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And I remember just, that's what I did. I, I, like, I rolled my eyes at the Holy Spirit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know? But it was so good because I'm like, you know, that, what I'm thinking about is just not right. Or, or, or my new favorite one. Because, you know, I've been thinking a lot about what breaks up people's relationships. Not like, like marital relationships or, or romantic, but just like the, the, the issues with people. It's almost always an accusation in your heart. Like you have a situation 
and what you expected to happen and what you experience are different, right? And when that happens, then you fill the gap with either trust or suspicion, with either I trust this person's heart or I'm suspicious of their motives. And know what's amazing is? When you fill that gap with suspicion, you know what that is? It's accusation. And you know what happens when you fill that gap with accusation? Who's the accuser of the brethren? Satan, that's what the Bible says. So of course it's gonna break apart a relation. Of course you're gonna struggle with somebody. I can't believe they do that. Well, you just put suspicion in the gap. Maybe they didn't do that at all. Maybe you're just misunderstanding what they were thinking. But right as you accuse them in your heart, guess what? It starts to tear it apart. Now, isn't that where all of us live every single day, <laughs> right? But when you realize who the accuser of the brethren is, every time I put suspicion in the gap, even if I think I'm justified in doing it, because I know Satan's the accuser of the brethren, do I want to follow him? No, I don't want to follow him at all. Neither do you. But again, that's what happens when you get your mind renewed. And of course, when all that's happening, then with our lives, we begin, begin to prove what is that good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. Because God is transforming us and then our lives begin to take on different qualities. And that's an invitation for each one of us. For each one of you. Jesus is saying, listen, either way you're going to be conformed or transformed. It's going to be one or the other. But I'm inviting you to present yourself to me and I'll transform you. And I'll do it by renewing your mind. And as I do that, your life is going to begin to take on the qualities that prove out what is God's good and acceptable and perfect will. But either way, you're being changed. Today, you're going to be changed. It's just a matter if you're going to be transformed or conformed. Now, from that invitation, look at what happens next. Verse 3 of Romans 12. It says this. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Now, I think this is beautiful. Once somebody presents themselves to God as a living sacrifice, now what we're encouraged to do is humbly join the party. Because there's no such thing as being a child of God apart from the family of God, right? And really what God is saying is that once you, when you come to the Lord and you say, God, I'm going to make the choice to give you my life, then God says, guess what? I've also made you part of something so much bigger than yourself. This thing called church. Now, church is not a building. Church is a called out group of people. But what's interesting here is right away, Paul starts talking about this idea of church and the will of God for somebody who believes in Jesus is for them to be part of this thing called church. Now, but in order to become part of the church, notice you need to come in a humble way, right? Because look at what he says. He says, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but think soberly. Now, if anyone's had uh, an experience with church, one of the things that is common is that people are not what? Humble. Everyone's like, well, my way is the right way. You know? And, and, and everyone feels that way, right? But what's amazing is that right as he talks about church, the key to church is that everyone comes not having an elevated view of themselves. Now, Paul's reasoning for not having an elevated view is very, very powerful because Paul is saying, look what he says. He says, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith, for we, verse 4, are many members in one body, but all members do not have the same function. You know what he's saying? He's saying, listen, you have to come humbly because you have to realize that you're not the total package in and of yourself. You're a part with a function, not the whole. Now, think about it. I want to let that land for a second because in some ways, this is why church in our cultural moment that we're living right now has fallen on such hard times because our world that we live in, that we've been conformed to says, you're the complete package. You don't need church. You don't need somebody else. You don't need 
community. You have everything that you need right on yourself. And guess what? It sets us all up for failure because guess what? Not everybody is good at everything. Not everyone is good at everything. And we were not created to be autonomous individuals alone. We are created to be autonomous individuals that realize that we are part of a body. And that body has all different parts. All, everyone brings something different. God has preordained that we all have different functions within it. Like even right now, as we're, we're here together at Crossroads, like I'm teaching, and there's some of you who are like, I would love to do what he's doing right now. And some of you are like, you couldn't catch me dead up there. Right? And guess what? Both of them are right on for you. Wherever you land. But what we have a tendency to do is think, oh, well, psh, you know, it's got to be my way. And no, in order for the church to function the way God wants, everybody has to come humbly, knowing that God has given to each person their own function to do, the own piece of the puzzle. And I think what's so tragic in the day and age in which we live is that so often people are like, well, I'm going to take my marbles and play on my own. But the thing is, is it's boring to play marbles on your own. And or I think it's even more boring to play marbles with people who are just like you. Because what I've learned as a follower of Jesus, is God brings together people who I never would have guessed. And he makes them your family. And when you're together, you learn all sorts of things. You learn things that you would have never known. If you were just with your niche group, the group of people that are just like those people, if you're just with those people, then everyone's just kind of the same. But then you get people from all these different backgrounds and you put them together and now all of a sudden there's so much things that we can learn. People see things from different angles. I'll never forget, I was sitting in a, in a Bible study. This must have been about almost 20 years ago now. You know? And I remember there was all these people there and, and, and some, of the, some of the folks had, had advanced degrees in theology and they were talking about all this stuff and they were, they were like, they were bickering and debating about a piece of scripture. And finally, there was a, there was a, a gentleman there who was, had just retired, you know, and he was a, you know, a laborer. You know, he had to, he, one of those guys who his hands were just calloused, scarred up, you know? And at some point, he's like, you know, guys, I don't know about all that stuff. I just know that Jesus wants you to love each other. That's all he said, the whole small group. And I looked, and I looked over, I'm like, bro. After I'm like, you're so right. He said, I don't even know what they were talking about. I just don't think that they were loving each other. And what's beautiful is, is that that guy's simple biblical encouragement was, so, was the most powerful thing I heard. These guys have advanced degrees and they're arguing about this, that. And he's like, yeah, hey, I just think Jesus wants you guys to love one another. And I was like, everyone has a different role to play. Now, he wasn't disparaging the theologians and I'm not either. But the thing is, is that not one of us has it all together. We're all parts of the body with different functions. And the key for us is to humbly join the party, to be a part of what God is doing. It's like, it's like what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 to 14. He says, for as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being member are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit you were baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For, in fact, the body is not one member, but many. Now, I love that. And it's one of the things that I love so much about the Crossroads family. Because you're all so different from one another. You know, it's like, like in this church family, there's people from every different background possible, all the different ages. I always get nervous when I go to church where it's all older people, or if I get to church, it's all younger people. I always get nervous, you know why? Because then nobody has to grow. <laughs> nobody has to come humbly because everyone's exactly the same. They want the same things, you know? And listen, and I realize that as a big family, I realize that in a church of many thousand, I always say it, you know, if you put five people together, you get five set of preferences, you put 50 people together, you get 50 set of preferences. You put 4,000 people together, guess what you get? 4,000 set of preferences, which can make some of our jobs quite challenging, right? But here's the thing. 
Sometimes we just say, is this just my preference? Or is there really something there? And you know what happens is that simple question is an act of humility. See, like, as we're encouraging all of you to join small groups this week, I hope that there are people who are totally different from you in your small group. You know why? Because you're going to learn how to love one another. You're going to learn how to see certain things differently. And I'll be honest with you, it's a lost art in our day and age, isn't it? Because our world that is conforming us says you can only enjoy people who are just like you, who have the same background as you, same age group as you, same values as you, same this, same that. And Jesus actually says, actually, no, I'm going to save people from every different background. I'm going to put them together. And I'm going to teach them how to humbly function as one body. I mean, many of you know what it's like when you're sick. Sometimes your body, is, your body is fighting against itself. Sometimes you're sick and your body is trying to fight off a disease. But other times, the body attacks itself. And in a lot of ways, that's the day and age in which we live because we live in a world that people don't think I should come humbly. They think, well, I'm the whole package. Everyone should just come in lockstep with what I want or it's a big problem. But what would it look like for you in all of your relationships to humbly join the party? To humbly just show up and say, I'm gonna realize that God created me to be part of something bigger than myself. And it's not easy. Can we just be honest? When you have to humbly come, isn't it not easy? Super hard. Because you know how it is. You want to eat breakfast, you get to make it your way. You're like, I want what I wanted for breakfast. You know, I, I remember I grew up in the day and age where my mom was like, I'm making one breakfast, you either eat it or you starve. Now I realize I was abused as a child. <laughs> I didn't know it at the time. Because now it's like every kid's got to have their own meal, you know what I mean? Like, and everyone, now I'm not, I'm only kidding, I wasn't really abused. But like, that's kind of like, I can't, they made me eat oatmeal, I hate oatmeal. It's like, it's old. you ate, you're here. Like, you know, but it's like, but we live in that kind of a day and age where everyone gets it the way you want it, right? And then you come together and you're like, it makes sense that nobody can agree on anything because everyone's so used to getting it their own way, but because of God's mercy and because of God's grace and the finished work of Jesus, the body of Christ comes together humbly and says, I'm going to be a part of this party. I want to join this thing. And then notice what it says next, verse 6 of Romans chapter 12. It says, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion with our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy, mercy with cheerfulness. And so listen, when you humbly join the party, then you just need to use your gifts. You just need to use your gifts. He's saying, listen, as we come together humbly, as we become part of this body, we realize that each one of us has differing gifts according to the way God's grace has worked into our lives. And the key for each one of us is to use those gifts in accordance with God's heart and his purposes. Now, what's interesting is if you look at all these gifts that are explained here, notice you have the gift of prophecy, the gift of ministry or service, the gift of teaching, the gift of exhorting, the gift of generosity, the gift of leading, the gift of mercy. All of these gifts, except for maybe prophecy, none of these are sign gifts. None of these are unique gifts of the Spirit like tongues and their interpretation. These are just normal, everyday, moving through life gifts. I don't think we often realize that, that, that for each one of us, you're moving through your life every single day and God just wants you to humbly be a part of what he's doing. What, what, what prophecy in its most basic definition is to call into question the status quo and give a vision for a more beautiful future. That's what prophecy is. Some of it tells, foretells future events, a small percentage of it, right? So as you move through your day, you get the opportunity to, when you, see, when you see someone stuck in a rut, you can say, hey, listen, what if this is what God has for you? What if God doesn't want you to be beat up and broken down? What if God wants to receive you just the way that you are and he wants to do a fresh work in your life? You know, when, when, you, when you talk to someone and they're all judging everybody else, you're like, you know, hey, listen, I know that, that probably feels normal. We live in a world that does a lot of that. But what if you just thought the best of people? What if you gave people the benefit of the doubt? How much happier would you be? How much more fun would you have? 
What if you realize that all your judgments, they're not right anyway? You're prophesying. You're calling into question the status quo, right? In ministry, we're all called to service. Serving one another. Jesus said the greatest in his kingdom is the, service, is the servant of all. When you teach, we all have an opportunity to teach. All of our lives are being lived out loud. Whether, whether your amplifiers turn all the way up to 11 or whether it's down real low and you got headphones on, you know, your life is teaching. You do it in accordance with the grace that God has given you. When you have the gift of exhortation to encourage people, guess what? You use that gift of exhortation. When you have the gift of generosity, you do it, you be exceedingly generous. When you lead, and we're all leading in different ways. We all have different leadership functions, right? You do it with diligence. And you go on and on and on. See, one of the greatest needs today is for everybody to not only join the party humbly, but to use the gifts that God has given them. To not hold them for ourselves. And that's why Peter said this in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. He says, as each one of us has received a gift, minister it one to another. As good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be glor belong all glory and honor. You see that? So we, 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 it ties right back into where it begins. Whatever gifts God has given you, minister to one another. You, you present yourself to God for transformation. He says, listen, then I want you to humbly join this thing called the church, and I want you to use the gifts. And as you use the gifts by the Spirit, then God is glorified in Jesus. And it forms a beautiful, complete circle. And my friends, as I bring this message to a close, I just want to encourage you simply this. God wants you to show up, and not just show up and take up space, but show up and be engaged because God wants to transform you. And as God is doing that work of transformation, we have to remember that we are better together than we are as individuals. Don't get me wrong. In a sense, it feels easier to be an individual, but in the long run, we all know that it's not. Because when push comes to shove, you need there's other people around. You need people with other skill sets, other ways of seeing things. So God wants us to be in community, but we have to be humble in order for that thing not to shred itself. And then as you're in community, there's no leeches on the community. Everybody uses the gifts. Everybody puts in what God would have. And when that happens, the body is healthy. And then the amplification of the message of Jesus in the world when the people of God are functioning well together. Now all of a sudden, there's a wall of amplifiers. And that volume is turned up. It not, could not just fill a house, it could fill a stadium. It could fill the whole world with the message of the good news of Jesus. And that's what God wants. So let's bow our heads and our hearts as we pray together.